us. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Deborah Barnes for AJR, and welcome to this panel on Jewish history and genealogy for the Association of Jewish Refugees. For anyone not familiar with AJR, we are the national charity supporting Britain's Jewish refugees and survivors of Nazi oppression, and we're committed to the education of others about the Holocaust. For more information about what we do, please go to our website and follow us on social media. So as, we, as you can see, we've um, launched a poll um, of one question and you can click on as many options um, as you like. So please do, do take, uh, take part in that. And um, I'm just gonna then introduce our panelists and I'm delighted that we have uh, four experts with us today. So we have Sarah Williams, who's the editor of Who Do You Think You Are magazine. We have Jeanette Rosenberg, OBE, who's education lead for the Jewish Genealogical, I knew I couldn't say it. Say it, Jeanette. Jewish Genealogical Society of Great Britain. Thank you. <laughs> and part-time professional genealogist. Elise Barth is Senior International Tracing Service Archive Researcher at the Wiener Holocaust Library. And Debbie Cantor, who's Archives Volunteer at World Jewish Relief. Welcome everybody. And now I'm going to hand over to Sarah to start the conversation. Thank you. Right. Well, um, I think I've just accidentally ended your poll, by the way. <laughs> I no, I think it's... Oh, relaunched. No, I tried to clear it off the front of my page. I've relaunched it. Don't worry. Oh, no. It's fine. Don't worry. Everything's disappeared. I'm really sorry, everyone. I was just trying to move it. I pressed the wrong button. That's technology for you. But anyway, it's great to see everyone here. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for inviting me, Devi. Um, so it, it's been brilliant to, to come along and see you all and talk a bit about family history because I think it's often, it's sort of sometimes had a bit of a bad press. It's not seen as real history. And actually I can't think of a history that is more real than, than that lived by our ancestors and the ordinary past. And I think, you know, a lot of children at school, they're taught about great names, what all the great people did, great, you know, and, and not really how life was lived and, and what people's experiences were. So obviously my job, I'm the editor of Who Do You Think You Are magazine. I spend my whole time looking at uh, the past. <laughs> I live in the past. I love it. Um, and I think, it has given me a lot of balance in life, uh, understanding, uh, really understanding where I come from and I share that with my children. And obviously um, there's, sometimes there's a block there within the Jewish um, uh, lives where you can't go beyond a certain space and there's a lot of trauma there. And a lot of our readers, and we have, you know, obviously Jewish readers, but we have a lot of readers who've got trauma in their family background. And part of their reason for doing family history research is it's a healing process. And um, so I'm a massive fan of family history, obviously. And but I'm, I'm, I really think what it can do and um, is important. And I think it can be neglected. And, and what a lot of people find is they wish they'd asked questions earlier. Um, this is one thing I hear more than anything from my readers and people I meet at family history societies. They wish they'd done this earlier. They wish they'd asked questions earlier. And I recognize that for some people there isn't that generation to ask. Uh, and that's when the documents start to come into play understanding the context, understanding the background to what you see, um, because a record is obviously just a piece of paper. What, why was it generated and what can that tell us? So that's sort of what we're here today. I'm not the expert that you're, you've come to see. I'm just here to say hello and to tell you how, how important I think what you're doing, if it's your first steps, or it might be your 50th steps, I don't know, hundreds, thousands. Um, there are always more steps to take and, um, 
and I know it is difficult. So I hope what you'll get today is some guidance. It's not impossible. Don't, you know, don't be frightened. Um, Jeanette will give you some wonderful tips on, to, on all of that. So um, first of all, I would like to introduce you to Elise Bath. She's going to talk about the Vino Holocaust Library, um, sort of recently rebranded. It used to, you know, was it as the Vina Library. Um, on the Who Do You Think You Are TV series, it frequently features. So the Vina Library, I know, has been involved in many, um, many episodes and is just such a crucial resource. So I've heard Elise was telling us last week that they have reopened or they are reopening. So Elise, do tell us more about this and, and what you can offer people who want to research their family during lockdown. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen and we'll see if that works first off. Um, how's that working for anyone? Great. Okay. Great, good. Um, so yes, in terms of our reopening, we have begun a partial reopening of the physical building, which is in Russell Square, obviously under very constricted circumstances. And you can't just walk up, you do need an appointment um, if you do want to go in and use the resources of the library in person. Um, but all of the information about that is um, included on this blog link here, on this blog post here. If you can't or you're not comfortable going into the building, which is completely fair enough, we've got a huge range of online resources. I've got a little list here of some which are useful for general contextual research about um, the Holocaust, for example. Um, which is useful, as Sarah was saying, for contextualising the information that you have and the documents that you may have. Again, I don't want to focus on that in too much detail because that's not what we're about today. We're about family research. But again, this link here gives a really good description of the various digital um, resources and the various ways that the Vino Holocaust Library is trying to help people carry out digital research generally into the Holocaust. Um, however, as we are here today to talk specifically about family research, um, I'm going to focus mainly on that. Um, so the main resource that is useful for helping people with their family research that's held by the Vina Holocaust Library is the International Tracing Service Archives, which is known as the ITS. Um, the ITS contains over 30 million documents from the time of the Holocaust and the immediate post-war period and relates to the experiences of over 17 and a half million people. So we're talking about things like um, prison lists, concentration camp records, but also post-war material and um, things like displaced persons records, emigration lists and compensation claims. So there's a huge amount of material in there. The physical archive is in Bad Arlson, Germany and is referred to as the Arlson archive. But here at the Wiener Holocaust Library, we have a digital copy of that archive. This is used at the library for academic research, but also for family tracing. Um, and that is what I do. That's most relevant to our conversation today as well. So people come to me um, and my colleague, Mary, um, who works alongside me um, on ITS research, and they may give us information about their grandfather, say, or their mother, someone who was caught up in the Holocaust, and they want to find out more information about them. My colleague, Mary, and I, then search through the archive for traces of the sort person. Um, whenever we can find anything, we get copies of the documentation, uh, we decode it and we translate as necessary. And we try and write up a, a report that summarizes what, what's going on. So we don't just send out um, a document with someone's name on it, say we, we try and explain what it is and what it means and also where else people can go to search for information. For further information, sorry. Um, it's a free service. There is a very high demand, and these research cases can take weeks and weeks, so it can take quite a long time um, before we're able to complete the research and get back in touch. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale, uh, so far in 2020 alone, we've traced the experiences of 245 individuals who were caught up in the Holocaust. So we're really trying to. Um, to, to meet the demand as best we can. So I, I do apologise if it's, if it's a bit of a longer wait. And I've really seen a spike in inquiries during this lockdown period. I think it ties in with what uh, Sarah was saying about um, needing that sort of balance that comes from knowing your identity and knowing sort of who you are. I think people have more time for this at the moment. 
whatever it is, we're definitely seeing a spike in, in inquiries, but we are still working through them as best we can. So if, if you have a relative or someone that you want that, that was caught up in the Holocaust and you want us to find out if there was um, if there's any trace of them in the ITS archives, um, you can submit a research request via our website, which is here in, in our um, <coughs> excuse me, in the presentation. Um, but also, and I'm going to come back to this later with a, a quick demo, you can also access some of the archive online. This is a fantastic and recent development where there's about 26 million documents from the archive and now available online to go through. Anyone online can, can just register. You don't even have to register. You just log on and search through. So this is a fantastic resource. A really, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about it, as you can tell. Um, and I'm going to come back to that later uh, and give a very quick overview of how you can search through that. There are some tricks and, and tips. So basically, if you think there's maybe information in the ITS archives about a relative of yours, submit a research request via our website, but why not also have a dig around yourself on the online archive? Um, I'm very aware uh, we're trying to keep this going, so we've only got five minutes. I'm very happy to discuss any of this in, in the questions section later or in the discussion later, um, but for now I want to hand back uh, to Sarah and um, I think we're going to be hearing about, sorry that's my timer, tell me to stop talking. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to hand back now, so thank you very much. <laughs> And I'll stop sharing my screen. Oh, well, thank you for that, Elise. We won't expect you to use a timer. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we're going to be very relaxed about timings, but a uh, five minute timer, that's, uh, that's fine. I'm just going to introduce now uh, Debbie Cantor. Um, thank you very much. Uh, she's um, going to be looking at uh, the world, she's going to talk to us a bit about the World Jewish Relief Archive and what they offer to anyone wishing to research their family and have you, are you seeing this spike that, um, you know, that was mentioned by Elise, Debbie, is there anything like that? Um, we have, we've got a long list of requests, let's put it that way, there was a, a spike after the, um, the television programme about the Windermere children that was oh, on yes. BBC a big uh, demand uh, then so uh, we're, we're working our way through as well um, so yes as, uh, as Sarah mentioned I'm uh, uh, Debbie and I am a volunteer uh, for World Jewish Relief and I'm one of a, a small team it was part of a small team of volunteers and working with the archives um, so before I sort of explain um, what records we hold I just give you a little bit of background as to why World Jewish Relief has, um, has family documents. So um, World Jewish Relief was originally called the Central British Fund for German Jewry. And I'm sure um, some of you have heard that, if I recognize some of the names on the group and it's uh, lovely to see you. Um, and um, it, was, uh, it was established in 1933 um, in response to Hitler coming to power. Um, and the CBF recognized that uh, German Jews would uh, need help escaping Nazi Europe. Um, so after raising funds and lobbying the British government, refugees from Germany and Austria started arriving in the UK um, and the CBF helped find places for them to live and give financial assistance and were a point of contact in the UK. Um, detailed records were kept of most of the refugees who came as adults and those who came on the kinder transport um, and in fact, we have um, very uh, large records for the children, the over 700 children who came to the UK after, um, after the war as, as orphans. In fact, we, um, we had records for um, the family of Robert Rinder, whose uh, television program was shown on Who Do You Think You Are? And our records were used in some of the research for that. Um, these uh, records are stored, were stored in, in Bloomsbury House for many years um, and, and these are the documents that now make up the, uh, the World Jewish Relief Archive. Um, the originals are stored at the London Metropolitan Archive um, and, uh, but the, the records have now been digitized. Um, so up until the beginning of lockdown, um, myself and the team of volunteers uh, used to go into the office and uh, respond to the, rec the online requests that came in by looking up uh, individual family records. Um, that 
can't happen anymore. But fortunately, we've now um, managed to be get access to the archives from home. So we are working our way through the uh, through the backlog. Um, one ad advantage, uh, however, of the of the lockdown is that I've figured out how to use Zoom, and I've been doing lots more online meetings with family members, um, helping with the terminology, um, some of deciphering the handwriting. Um, and and, and, and I, I found out so normally towards the end of the meetings that one person's in London and one might be in Spain or, or Jerusalem, all around the world, different time zones. So it's, it's uh, something that I'm sure will continue once, um, once lockdown formally ends. Um, so, so some of the information that appears in the file is of course known to family members, but uh, there are regularly surprises that appear. Um, an example, we have a, a Ian Goldsmith um, knew his father, Robert Goldschmidt, was German and Jewish, um, but it was only when he began researching how to apply for um, a German passport and made contact with World Jewish Relief, um, he discovered his father and uncle had come to Britain on the kinder transport, and he was overwhelmed actually to find out that he'd come on the very first kinder transport um, from Germany on the 2nd of December 1938. Um, uh, the information he found in our archives enabled him to uncover details about family living in the States and family he didn't even know about in the United Kingdom. Um, so the archives contain a variety of documents, including the visa waiver documents synonymous with the kinder transport. I've got one here. I hope you can sort of see, um, see that. Yeah. Um, and uh, these are, include... Uh, very often the earliest photos of family members have of their relatives. Um, this document includes parents' names, addresses in Germany or Austria, and they often they also have the date of a uh, port of entry stamp on the back. Um, so th the level of detail um, about the lives of individual cases can be astonishing, um, including where they were working, how much people were earning, um, ongoing education, social health um, and welfare issues. Um, and training for employment. Um, other details documented in the files discuss clothes that were given, to cinema tickets provided, financial support and aid given to the refugees. Um, I've got an example here, just, it's not very easy to see, but just sort of to show you the sorts of things that we see on these documents. Um, there are sometimes other documents in the archive, including uh, school reports, letters, passports, and, and travel documents. Um, there, are, there are so many stories contained in the archives. Each record we find uncovers a, a new family history. Um, Siegfried Plout arrived in the UK aged 14 um, on the kinder transport from Berlin. Um, his three sons came into the World Jewish Relief Archive uh, to collect their father's uh, documents. Um, and the file shows that at the age of 19, we helped him get training in the city central garage and he went on to become a car mechanic. Um, uh, his sons then told us that eventually their father ended up owning a garage on the Finchley Road, um, in fact the building where the Jewish community, community centre is now located. Um, Secret's uh, sons were moved to hear how their father had was helped by the Central British Fund as well as, well as uh, learning about his early years in the UK. Um, and as, as you mentioned earlier, Sarah Siegfried had died at, at quite a, a young age and his sons had never taken the opportunity um, to ask their father about this part of his life. Um, so World Jewish Relief has uh, inspired by our history and we continued our work by supporting the poorest Jewish communities in Eastern Europe, helping older people with social welfare and health needs we are the British Jewish community's humanitarian response agency um, and respond to international disasters. And currently we're supporting people impacted by COVID-19 in some of the poorest countries in the world. Um, so if any of you have got a uh, family that arrived in the UK uh, during the 30s and 40s from Nazi Europe, then we may have documents for them in our archives. So um, I know there's going to be a handout at the end, so uh, with our, the link to our website. So please fill in your information on our website. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that, Debbie. And just to clarify, so you're talking about, um, you know, a lot of your data and your information 
has been uh, digitized, but people can't just go on and search that themselves because you give context. And so it has to go through you, even though, as you were saying, it is digitized. Yes, unfortunately, it has to come through us partly for the context, but more importantly, there's a lot of sensitive information. Uh, people don't even realize, you know, when we, we, we read through every file that we that we're about to send out and there's lots of information that people wouldn't generally want accessible to the general public no okay but um but you're there and and how and how big is your backlog <laughs> um i haven't counted but we the team's working hard and uh, we promise we'll get through all of them excellent yes i think it's going to get a bit bigger after this <laughs> I look forward yes. to it. You're just creating work for yourselves. And Good. Really. But um, yeah, no, lovely. Thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm, uh, I, I will, um, you know, look into that. That was all great. So thank you for that, um, Debbie. So now I'm going to uh, welcome on Jeanette uh, Rosenberg. Anyone, I'm pretty safe to say anyone involved in the world of genealogy in the UK will know uh, Jeanette. Um, I have yet to find out what Jeanette doesn't know about Jewish genealogy. <laughs> Although I'm probably not starting at a, at a high point myself, but she's, she really is a, an acknowledged expert. So we're very lucky to have her today. This is a massive topic. I mean, you all know, the more you look into anything, the more you find that is to discover. So um, Jeanette is not going to be able to give you all the contents of her knowledge <laughs> in one session here but I understand um, Jeanette you're going to give us some pointers and um, Jeanette is full of I would say you are full of hope you're a don't give up kind of person and um, because I know a lot of people feel this is a brick wall that you know can't be broken so we are here to inspire you today um, even even for small bits of information you can find can um, can be important. They're all important pieces of a huge jigsaw puzzle. So Jeanette, the great jigsaw puzzle of life, of family history, what, how can we find some of those missing pieces and slot them in to our okay. jigsaw? Thank you. Um, you did say I've got three weeks to talk to everybody. <laughs> No, Sorry. I promise I won't talk for three weeks. I probably could, uh, <laughs> or take the odd cup of tea. Um, <laughs> I guess my starting point is that family history isn't as easy as it suggests on TV. You know, just press a button and lo and behold, your tree will emerge. Um, I have actually been in an archive in New York um, and had someone do a drive by because they called at lunchtime to collect their family tree from the archive and if I hadn't been there and actually heard that happen myself I'd have said it never happened but it does and it did and my goodness um, however I don't want to uh, say don't do family history on the contrary there are plenty of places to go to for signposting and for help to find out about where and how your family lived before World War II and before the Holocaust um, and the handout from our event today, you will be able to download later on. Uh, AJR are going to send out an email by way of follow up to this event, and it will give you a link to download the handout, which has got a wide variety of different links and suggestions and ideas for resources about all the places that you can go to to get additional help, advice, and in some places access to records. And you'll then be able to follow the link, download the handout, save it to your computer, and you should be able to click through then to each of those different resources uh, and to all of the websites mentioned in the handout. Now, I obviously can't mention all of them today. Um, I couldn't even start to think of them. I'd be drawing up lists of lists of lists. But there is definitely information um, that's the first place to go for Holocaust survivors, but also for the second and subsequent generations for researching your family tree and for family history, whether or not you're reclaiming citizenship, restitution, or any of the other questions in our poll that's on the screen. Most of you were wanting to know what happened to your ancestors and to 
um, research and preserve the information for future generations. Uh, there's also information in the handout for searching, so for searching online, but also places you'll be able to visit in uh, whenever things return to new normal, whatever new normal is going to be like, we don't know. I should say, in addition to being on the panel here today, uh, all of us on the panel are excited to be part of the new Hidden Treasures project, celebrating the best of Jewish, uh, British Jewish archives. Um, the Hidden Treasures project launched last Sunday, and it's led by the Board of Deputies of British Jews and celebrates Jewish archives in Britain showcasing collections from across the UK uh, that tell the story of Jews and our experiences in Britain and helps communities and individuals preserve their stories. So if you've not come across that yet, it's only very new and I do encourage you to take a look. The link is on the handout. Now, of course, our families and their lives didn't start at the Holocaust, although for many of us, that's all we know because our family, my phone never rings. I'm going to switch it off, I do apologize. It will go off. Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Okay, it's now gone. Okay. Um, right, so our families didn't start um, with the Holocaust, um, but often for us, our families never spoke about what happened before the Holocaust uh, or where our families lived before the war. As we certainly heard Debbie say, some of the people uh, who, were, who were featured in, in the archive there. Um, researching our family history can help us find out more about where we came from. Uh, not all the records of inf and information in Europe was destroyed in the war, far from it. And searching can help reveal all kinds of details about where our family members and our ancestors came from and how they lived and the places where we came from. Sometimes we're also able to connect up with distant cousins too. Family history is so much more than names and dates and places. We want to find out about where our families lived, how they lived and what their lives were like too. And that information helps ground us and helps us feel somehow more complete. So one of the many things that I do is I'm the education lead for the Jewish Genealogical Society of Great Britain, uh, as you heard earlier. And I also lead our German special interest group. JGSGB is the UK's only Jewish genealogical society. And our Facebook group is a very good place for you to start. You're very welcome to post any questions you have on there. We're a friendly bunch and we'll all do our best to crowdsource any um, answers to questions that you may have. Then there's our German special interest group covering Germany and Austria and all the many other places German speaking Jews went to from Shanghai to the Dominican Republic and beyond. And I'm delighted to see a few people from the German special interest group among the many faces in front of me today. Uh, we can help and signpost you to information whether your family came to the UK or if you're based here and your family went somewhere else or branches of the family are, no matter where they are around the world, we probably know someone and can help you find a connection to research. So no matter where they went when they left or fled from mainland Europe. We work very closely with Jewish Gen, who have both geographic and Holocaust research groups and records and family tree data too. They help people trace their families from Eastern Europe, well actually uh, all over Europe. It's a one-stop shop for Jewish family history, covering different locations all around the world, both for Sephardi and Ashkenazi families. We can help signpost you and help you to make contact with key people in your ancestral locations in Europe so you can obtain copies of the records of your ancestors' lives. Sometimes this will be birth, marriage and death records, but also other information too, including tax records maybe, also travel documents and photographs of the houses that your family lived in, if they still exist. Um, the houses, that is not the photos. 
different information is available for different places, of course. Sometimes you can be really lucky uh, and locate information about your family stretching back several hundreds of years, especially if there's a rabbi hiding in your family tree. But that won't just be for everybody, of course. So we can help you start out with your research and gather the initial information from here in the UK that will help you step backwards from yourself to the places your families came from. Before looking in other countries, you might need to get copies of relevant UK birth, marriage and death records or wills, for example. And it's important to start with yourself and to do that first. Um, that way you make sure that you're researching your own family rather than another unrelated family who might have the same last name as yours. There are, after all, a lot of Rosenbergs and Cohens and Levies out there. I can see a few Rosenbergs in front of me too. Um, and I don't think you're my relatives yet. Uh, don't forget, the handout from today will guide you on how to find and get hold of all of these kinds of records. Now, one of the first UK documents many of us will find out about our families uh, who arrived here fleeing the Holocaust and mainland Europe is the UK's 1939 enumeration. It was taken on the 26th of September 1939 and it led to the issue of ration cards for World War II. You might also be able to find the HO396 cards. What are they, you say? Those are the internment and exemption from internment cards. Uh, then most likely you'll also find information about naturalizations when our family members became UK citizens and those usually have notices published in the Gazette which is the UK's free to search official journal um, and that will lead you to naturalization certificates those come from the National Archives at Kew and if we're lucky sometimes they lead to a thicker file of documentation about our family members too Sometimes you have to apply uh, for those files to be opened using a, freedom of using a freedom of information query, but don't let that put you off. You'll be able to see all sorts of useful information. The Gazette holds information about the lives of ordinary people, not just the, the rich and famous. It includes the changes of name and lots of our families change their names and anglicised them, but not everybody. Um, it also holds um, the naturalization information I mentioned earlier, as well as that, the Gazette holds bankruptcy and insolvency information. So if any of your family went mukhula, as we say in Yiddish, um, you'll find information in the Gazette. Now we also say, if you don't want to know the bumps in the road, please don't look. Then of course there's AJR's journal and uh, I know my family couldn't and wouldn't be where we are without AJR. Um, AJR's journal can connect you to the Kinder Transport information and database, will signpost you to all sorts of information, for example, about the Kitchener camp and many of the other places our families went when they first arrived. AJR's Refugee Voices and Internment Microsite will take you to the map for Swiss Cottage and Finchley Strasse. I'm seeing if anybody's nodding when I say that. That's an area around Swiss Cottage where many of our German speaking uh, family members found refuge when they first arrived in London. It can also lead you to information um, if your family were interned, like my family were, on the Isle of Man. Um, if your family came on the kinder transport, it's likely that World Jewish Relief will find, will have your information. I know you have information on my family and I'm very grateful for that. Um, you took my family members right up to the point when they took on their UK citizenship and didn't need your help anymore. So big thanks from me. Uh, World Jewish Relief rescued 75,000 Jews from Europe in the 30s and 40s and of course the 10,000 on the kinder transport. Other than all of this you'll find, other inf you'll find information about those who sadly perished online and available um, about the Holocaust from Yad Vashem's central database of show a Holocaust victims names and also find access to pages of testimonies. 
you can also locate other records in the ITS Arrelson database. And um, that's at the Arena Holocaust Library. Again, another thank you. Uh, Elise and colleagues have been able to find information about my family. I'm now going to hand you back to Elise, who's going to tell you what you'll be able to find. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Jeanette. Um, Yes, what I'm going to do now is uh, show you how to do a very basic search on the online records of the ITS. So I'm going to share my screen again. Hope this works. Um, can you see Arlton Archives? Yep, excellent. Good, good. So if you follow the link in the um, PowerPoint presentation that I had, and I'll share that with you, um, this is sort of the home screen of the Arlton Archives, um, and this is the online archive that you'll want to navigate to if you're searching for information about an individual. Um, okay. So when you land on the on the screen, this is this is what it will look like. As a very rough guide, the left hand side is where you search. The right hand side will be where um, your results come up. Um, just let me check one thing a second. Yes, I did think I'd gone wrong. So. This is where we are. Earlier this week, I was researching a chap with the surname Diallo. So I just thought I'd use him as an example just because it's quite um, fresh for me. So you just put in literally the name like this. Make sure you, click, you keep this include synonym box checked. Um, there's all sorts of various spellings uh, in, in the ITS archive of surnames and the like, but it searches phonetically. So don't worry too much about getting the exact spelling right because it's it's, it's quite clever in that regard, it, it searches phonetically. So once you click search, the results will appear down here on the left hand side and you can scroll down to show all the data results. Now as you can see it includes okay. various different people with different um, years of birth, different spellings of the name, so sometimes you just have to dig through and have a look at the records and see which one's your, your chap, but I know that this is the fellow I was looking for, this is his date of birth. So when you uh, Elise, we're not, I don't think we're seeing what you're seeing. Ah, rats. Okay, well in that case I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, I don't know, can anyone else? Anyone else? No. Uh, no. We're just seeing the first out. screen. We, oh, that's a shame. Uh, refresh? Yeah. I, I've got, if I go, can you see my well, we, we can see the search page, but the search box is empty. Right, okay, that's unfortunate. Um, I will yeah. have got an alternative way of doing this, which I will do now. If you'll just bear with me, forgive me. Um, right. So here, what now, can we... now we can see something, yeah. Right, great, good. <laughs> I did have a backup plan in case that worked. Excellent. Um, so here you can see, this is the basic, very basic version of the information. So you can put a person's name in here, um, where I've said enter the search term, when you click search the results will appear beneath. You'll have to navigate through to find the person that you're particularly interested in. As I said, click through the records, make sure that you can see um, cross-reference the information with any other details that you may have. When you click on it, the document itself will appear on the right hand side. And then you can right click and save any documents that are relevant to you. Now obviously, if um, if that document, sorry, I'm slightly thrown now. <laughs> if the document brings up a lot of quite specific niche information that needs decoding or translating, this isn't very, very good for you. Um, so, but fortunately, Arlton Archives have developed an e guide which helps decode various pieces of information on the original document. Um, so, this is the link uh, to that website, but now I can't, I've realised I can't show you it, but I'm going to stop showing my screen. Basically, that email, when that when you click on that link to the e-guide resource, Arlton Archives has created a really fantastic um, mechanism whereby you can you can explore what the cards show, it decodes what they mean. A lot of them, it's quite, there's a lot of coded information that made sense at the time, but the meanings have been lost or aren't necessarily obvious at the first glance. So this e-guide resource helps you decode that and unpick it and translate it. Now, as I said, it's a fantastic resource. It honestly is, um, there's so much material on there to, to be uncovered, but I haven't yet come across a case where we haven't been able to find more documents, not because 
well, basically because there's more documents that we have than are online. So I would always say submit a, an ITS inquiry for us to do it as well, but have a dig around because you never know what you're going to find. And as you quite rightly said, you know, one tiny bit of information can really be the key to unlocking um, a huge narrative um, about your family. And I know we've had cases where um, I've been researching someone and thinking, hang on, this seems quite familiar. I've, I've already researched this individual. And because I've recognized that I was able to connect family members, um, one family in the UK, and they had relatives in America that they had no idea about. Um, so the, there is real power in this archive, um, not only for reunions, but just for things like grounding, grounding yourself as well and knowing where you come from and what your identity is. I, I agree completely with everything Sarah was saying about the significance and the importance of family research. Um, so on that note, apologies for the demonstration not working quite as, as well as, as I'd hoped. Um, but on that note, I'd like to open it up a bit more and pass back to Sarah. Oh, thank you. That was really interesting. Sorry your technology failed you. In fact, one of the things I think uh, is very interesting that technology is transforming family history research. But going back to uh, what Jeanette was saying, I mean, it, it, these databases and being able to just take type a name in like newspapers been where you couldn't really use usefully in the past in the same way, because you wouldn't know when something had happened. And now you can search them. So you know the internet indexes database is brilliant but what Jeanette was saying the other thing that the internet helps with is now it's very easy through their Facebook page with the Jewish Genealogical Society of Great Britain you know that they can share so technology is not just enabling us to search databases it's enabling us to make connections with people who know where to look and actually what you've just been saying there is you know where to look you know that it isn't just a case of us searching in those databases why not ask why you know we can use technology to say help help <laughs> i know you don't want everyone to just say help and part of the fun of doing a jigsaw puzzle is putting those pieces and looking for the, in yourself and looking for them for yourself but you can waste a lot of time get stuck and go nowhere without enlisting the help and it's a great community out there um, you know, we all want to help people. And um, I mean, we've got sort of eight pages of Q&A in our magazine every month. And, and uh, you know, I, I love it. We all love looking and helping other people. It's a part of what family history is all about. Now, uh, Deborah, are we, is the idea that people are going to, are people going to throw in some questions from the floor? Have we got too many people? Is that going to be tricky? Um it's 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 up to you i mean we do have a lot of people um if people want to write a question in the chat function. i've had a couple of chat yeah. questions which okay. I, could, I could probably read out to you yeah. so i just had somebody who said she did email the archives about a year ago and they sent her a lot of information in an email if she goes on a website on the website herself will she find the same information is that the ITM archive? Sorry. No, that's the Alson archives. Right, yeah. Um, it will be the same information that, that she'll be able to find because the online, the documents that are online, it's a smaller section of what we have. So we have more than what is online. I mean, it's always still worth, worth a dig around and worth a look, um, but yes, it's, it's the same, same material. Okay. Um, I can just, sorry, the questions are coming up thick and fast as I'm trying to read them out. Um, sorry, I've lost all the way back. I have to go all the way back now. If you put in an ITS inquiry, then realise you missed something off. Can you add to it later? Um, you can do, or you can just email, um, if you email info at, the, you know, go on our, our website and find the general info account email and email as an update that's fine as well we can we can do that right somebody's asking me whether they would be able to find information on a family that went to israel in 1934 can i help with that one yeah okay. um jgstb it works very closely with all of the many other jewish genealogical societies around the world and in this particular instance we'd introduce you to igra which is the Jewish Genealogical Society in Israel. They have great databases. They've been uh, getting copies of databases, making them out of the 
before the State of Israel was founded, Mandate Palestine Records. So we'd introduce you to them and they would be able to help you look in their database, uh, which is bi bilingual, it's both in English and it's in Hebrew. And sometimes the records, uh, even in Mandate days, were in Hebrew. So you can look in those records. So we'd say go there. Um. Okay, I, I am going to say that I, I am being inundated with messages at this point and we are not going to be able to ask all of them. So well, please bear in mind that Deborah, we will be sending a handout with a lot of information on it after this. Um, so we, a lot of the questions that are coming in are quite individual and I think it's probably fair if we stick to more general questions. Are you in agreement, Deborah? Yeah, um, unfortunately, than, I can't see them, so I'm going to no, have to leave I them. know, but with 128 people, I can't ask individual yeah. questions about your specific family member. Yeah. So if you bear with me, and I will just read through and answer the other question, ask some other questions coming up. Um, is, the, is the information in the Owlson archives similar to the info that's on the Yad Vashem archives? Um, there will be some overlap. Yad Vashem has a copy of the Arlson archives. They have the same copy that we have, um, and Yad Vashem have, have other material as well. Um, to be honest, I'm not entirely, I'm not 100% sure how Yad Vashem use their copy of, of the Arlson archives database. Um, right. So it's probably worth contacting both. Okay, so um, I'm presuming the archives, are, I've, I've had a few questions coming in saying, that people looked at the archives maybe a year ago or researched their family. Is the information constantly updated? So is it worth them looking again a couple of years later? I can see Jeanette nodding. Yes, yeah, there's, there's always new information coming up. Um, I'd, yeah, I'd say not, you know, maybe every, every year we get an update to, to the um, archive. Um, so yeah, it, it's worth coming back um, every couple of years. Right. Um, I've had somebody who said that um, Yad Vashem are all, also always asking for help on their records. So if you can always provide them with information to Yad Vashem, um, which may help someone else or may connect you with a family member. So that's come up as a comment. Um, can I add something on that? Yes. Um, as a Jewish family historian, everybody researching their Jewish family history, if you find as you research and you come across a Holocaust victim in your family, obviously most of our Holocaust victim family members have no grave. If they are not already recorded in a page of testimony at Yad Vashem, we do encourage you to do that and to record even the smallest bits of information to add into the records available on a page of testimony at Yad Vashem. Right. Okay. And um, I've had, there's quite a few questions relating to people who had family from the 18th or 19th century in Poland or Lithuania or, you know, those, those countries who perhaps are, is there somewhere people should be searching and will we include that in the handout? Yes, it's in the handout. Your starting place is to go to the Jewish Gen website. Jewish Gen is international one-stop shop. It's written um, with the American family historian in mind. So some of the spellings don't look very English, but we'll forgive that. It has geographic sections. So Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Austria, Czech Republic, Hungary, and many more and a very large holocaust database as well and there are constituent parts of all of the databases and different ways that you can search but also there's a unified search to search everything on the jewish gen website um, and it's work it deals with or it manages soundex and that's for all of those quite difficult to write down spellings that were written in Eastern European languages or Yiddish or whatever other language, Hungarian, uh, to name but a few. So it will go on a soundex. So you make sure you search something that sounds like the family name you're looking for and you're going to get a lot of 
different uh, responses to your search, but hopefully some of those will be the family members you're looking for. Right, okay, that, so that, there seems to be, I'm just looking back through the questions, um, there's obviously quite a lot, so perhaps that answers quite a lot of the questions. Um, if you just bear with me one minute, another couple of questions. Okay. Um, can, I, can I ask a question actually has anybody ever had an experience of someone who's who's asked about their family member or name and not had any results is that even a possibility um I'll go first if that's right yes um sadly even though the ITS archive is is vast and very significant there are cases where there is no trace of a person um, in the archive, even when we know for a fact that they were a victim of the Holocaust, which is obviously always um, very disappointing and frustrating. Um, so yes, I'm afraid it, it does happen that there are there are these these blanks still. Mm. And but that's what Jeanette was saying about even a tiny detail about a person being recorded on on a on a page of testimony at Yaltsin is, is very significant and important. All right. Um, I mean, I think I, there are lots of questions coming in. Lots of people are asking quite specific questions about their family. So I think probably it would be a good idea if, when we send the, I, um, the handout and then there's a lot of information and they can then follow those individual queries up. Um, what's of your course, thought? as Jeanette said earlier, they, um, a lot of these, there are a lot of Facebook groups and forums uh, you know that that where you can put these sorts of questions up uh, and and get help. I, I really, you know, I really recommend doing that. So I mean, we used to have a forum. We now actually have a Facebook group, uh, but a specialist Facebook group like Jeanette uh, with the Jewish Genealogical Society of Great Britain. You can just whatever question you've just put up now that's not being read out, pop it over to their Facebook group, um, and you'll just get. It's like crowdsourcing an answer and and so you'll get lots of little bits and and that's that can be really helpful as well right i'd also say jeanette and i don't know if you agree with me here but we've certainly i, I know people who uh, with jewish finding where some have come from have found and now that newspapers are getting digitized if they were fairly successful and they get an obituary we've certainly found people uh, now where the obituary has mentioned where they were born um, and 19th century a lot of newspapers out there I mean some people hid their backgrounds a bit but certainly uh, in, in some areas uh, you know of the UK you will find people very proud of where they've come from uh, and they will have said in their in their obituary so we I, I just know that we've had sometimes we've had luck with that very true and of course um wish to mention here the ajr journal um because a lot of people in our community who were early members of ajr have obituaries published in the ajr journal and there's also the tracing column in the ajr journal and you've put amazing optical character recognition on the ajr journal so it does pay to look for people in there as well. And sometimes, just sometimes, magic happens. Somebody's just sent me a message actually saying there's a, apparently a Facebook group called Tracing the Tribe. Are you familiar yeah. with that, Jeanette? There are two. It's a bit like the town with two synagogues, the one that you pray in and the one that you'd never be seen dead in. <laughs> there is the Jewish genealogy portal and there's Tracing the Tribe. And they are the two most enormous Facebook groups. Um, they have about half a dozen moderators on each of the Facebook groups and each has got over 20,000 members. And most people are members of both of them, but the two organizers don't talk. You know, figures, right? What was the second name? So Tracing the Tribe and what? And what's the, the other one? The Jewish Genealogy Portal. Okay, so maybe we could pop that on our handout. I don't know. I think they're already in there. Oh, okay, fabulous. Um, so I'll leave it to you guys to wrap up, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Deborah, again for inviting us all. I suppose I'd better leave the last word with you, Deborah, as this is your party. 
<laughs> well, thank you, everyone. I mean, yeah, again, apologies that we haven't been able to deal with personal questions about specific people, members of your family and everything. But um, within the next hour, we will be sending an email um, through to everybody who registered today um, with Jeanette's um, very comprehensive handout. And I promise it will keep you busy for the next week or so, at least. Um, and there's, there's, there are so many things to click on there that, um, yeah. So Seven pages um, of clicking on, so yeah. Yeah, lots of <laughs> clicking ons. So, um, you know, we, we, we really hope that somebody, everybody's going to be able to find some, some new information. And I would just also repeat what was said about new information. I myself got some new information last week from the ITS by the the Wiener Holocaust Library that I, I thought I knew everything and I and I got uh, a copy of the list that my mother was on um, the children's home she was found in at the end of the war in France um, which I've been looking for for years and and suddenly just popped up last last week so um, just keep going keep trying and uh, and good luck and thank you very much to all our speakers I hope you all found it interesting um, like we said, it has been recorded and uh, there will be a, a recording up on our YouTube channel within the next week or so. So look out for that. OK. And with okay. that, we wish you a good afternoon. Bye. -bye. Thank, thank you. We've had quite a few um, thank yous in already. I've already getting emails saying how interesting it was. And we'd be delighted to hear of any leads that anyone picks up yeah. as well. Um, certainly to, to uh, put into the AJR journal and our e-newsletter. So let us know how you get on. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank uh -huh. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.